Welcome to Uni Princeton University Chapel. Please silence all cell phones and other devices. Exit doors are in the lobby, in the middle of the north side of the sanctuary facing Firestone Library, and to the right of the lectern. There are also red exit signs near the doors. Please do not stand in the aisles during the service. This is due to fire safety protocols. Thank you and enjoy your time at the chapel.
I invite you to join me in the call to worship as printed in the bulletin. This is a great and joyous festival day. Come to celebrate the amazing good news. We gather for worship in awe and wonder. The tomb is empty. Death is not the last word. Sing songs of praise for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God has answered our prayers with salvation. Jesus Christ is alive and we too shall live. Open your hearts and minds to the risen Christ. You are greeted by name and welcomed here. This is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please pray with me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on each of us this morning. Remove any and all distractions and obstacles that impede our ability to hear from you. God, we thank you for your son who has defeated death so that we might have life. We ask that you fill our hearts with joy and celebration on this day so that we might give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. In every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Here ends the reading.
A reading from Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Here ends the reading. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every one of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We have just heard my favorite account of the resurrection from the Gospels, but I may be alone in the universe in that opinion. Mark's resurrection text, as I've noticed in recent weeks, isn't even treated in some biblical commentaries. And when it is recommended for use in services, it's for the late, late night Saturday Easter vigil rather than glorious Sunday Easter morning. This isn't a glorious text. It doesn't go with lilies, hats, baskets of colored eggs, and the hallelujah chorus. Apparently, it was not satisfactory to the first generations of Christians either. They produ produced two different, happier endings and tacked them on to the conclusion of Mark's gospel. That's what we have in our Bibles. We're being purists here this morning. We're hearing the true end of his story. Mark's version of the resurrection and, I believe, his pointed and beautiful instruction to us on how to live resurrection-centered lives. Mark does not tie things up in a bow. Three exhausted, shattered women stumble over stones and tree roots at dawn hopeless that they could even get near the body of Jesus because of the weight of the stone covering the entrance to his tomb. The body would have begun to decompose and the cave would stink, but they wanted to try to do Jesus's corpse, though rotting, the respect of anointing with spices. But the stone has been rolled back. An unknown young man is inside. They become alarmed. He tells them that Jesus has been raised and that he will meet up with the disciples in Galilee and that they must tell the disciples this news. The women turn and run in terror and they say nothing to anyone about it because they are so afraid. The end. Happy Easter. If this is the end, then we can go home right now and start eating our candy. But it's not the end, and that's why I love Mark's version. His resurrection account in the original Greek syntax actually ends in the middle of a sentence that reads, Jesus is raised from the dead and the only witnesses tell no one, dot, dot, dot. It's not that Mark has an abrupt, ungrammatical ending to his gospel, Rather, his gospel doesn't end. 
It's not even open-ended, it's wide open, no ending in sight. Mark never hangs up the phone. His gospel has not concluded. The story is still unfolding. The movie is still playing, and we're now the actors in it. Mark ends his part of the story in the middle of a sentence so then we can take it on from there. We and almost a third of the Earth's human inhabitants are sitting in church this morning because many millions who came before us, each in their day, finished Mark's sentence and added more of their own. Today it is we who have the indescribable privilege of being entrusted to pick up the resurrection story that Mark passes on to us mid-sentence. We are the inheritors of the good news, the astounding news, the universe-altering news that God has resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead, opening up life beyond life to us all. Mark passes that to us like a basketball. We hold it now. It's come to be our turn in the history of time. How shall we narrate with the text of our lives this holy story's continuation? How shall we be every day of every year Easter people? I think that there are two ways to approach this project, two simultaneous tasks before us. In one, the question is, how shall we be Easter people? The other is, how shall I be an Easter person? The two are related, of course. Let's start with the first. How shall we be Easter people? I'll admit that I find myself frustrated at the overwhelming preoccupation amongst American Christians with a self-centered focus on faith. What is my personal relationship with Jesus? Who is Jesus to me? These are fine questions, and we'll get to them ourselves in a few moments. But alone, they are insufficient. They must be asked alongside, who is Jesus Christ for us today? Jesus didn't leave behind atomized, self-serving lone wolves, but a community of followers that spent much of its time trying to inhabit the gospel in their common life. Alone, they could touch the lives of individual people. Together, they could offer their society a gospel-based alternative to its materialism, self-centeredness, vain striving and thriving for power, its greed and cruelties and violence. But not the new Christians. They felt they could incarnate Christ's ethic of love, mercy, compassion, justice, and equality. Our first forebears in the faith decided that this meant that they would take care of the needs of the most vulnerable people in their society. We today could do so much more together to this end than we could ever do alone. Together we could testify to who the risen Jesus Christ is for us as we, like the earliest Christians, make sure that all of God's beloved children, and that is every human being, have enough food, have shelter, clothing, safety. In the 21st century, we can meet other basic needs for excellent education and health care. We can challenge together the dehumanizing heresy, heresy that enables the carpet bombings of human beings, oppressions, humiliations, denigrations. If God and Christ value every person equally, why don't we? We proclaim the fact of resurrection and we pick up the resurrection story that Mark entrusts us to tell when we work together to inhabit the gospel of Jesus Christ in our own day and time. And this is also our opportunity to do so individually. Who is Jesus Christ for each of us, and what does his resurrection from the dead mean for each minute of our individual lives? How should we regard every person we meet? How should we proceed through regular days of 
class or meetings or desk time or dinner, commuting, parenting, stressing, trying to be a good friend to those around us, regular days, priceless days. How do we let each regular person we meet know that Jesus calls them the light of the world? Today we learn that the end of our days on earth is not the end, but the beginning, just like the text of Mark's unending gospel. Life is sometimes very hard, but it is never endured alone. And at the end of this life's journey is not abyss, but the loving arms of eternity. This is all, this is only what Mark's gospel leaves us to share. Years ago now, I first read these words by a professor of New Testament at a New York seminary. She was interested in coming to seminary, had been sent to talk to me about it. We did talk about it. I explained the process for application, gave her the forms, smiled when done. She put her hands in the crutches she had leaned against my desk. Do you think they will accept me? She asked. Yes, I said. Do you really think they will accept me? Yes, I said, I really think they will accept you. But I'm dying, she said. Well, I heard me saying, we are all dying. But I'm really dying, she said. Well, I heard me say, we are all really dying. I've never seen someone not accepted in seminary because they were really dying. Really, she asked. I smiled, really. The writer continues, never had I heard these words this way, really. I felt those words walk down my spine. The truth, the deep truth had come out of me in those words and I knew it. The truth, deep truth, is that what we call living is really dying. We all walk toward death and call this life. The Gospels are the story of how Jesus brings life as he walks toward death. The Gospels are the story of how the death towards each of us is walking is the portal to new life in Christ beyond our profoundest earthly imaginings. The still unfolding text that we are writing is about how to live while we are really dying, that we may die into new life. The story passed on to us to tell is about how that story never ends. The witnesses to the resurrection say nothing, and so Mark invites us to find our own voice for telling the story. We get to use who we are, the identities and experiences that have formed us, our people, our histories, our communities, as we share with others the news of resurrection. We have to use who we are. We would be inauthentic otherwise. And who we are is all that Christ needs as his Easter people. We received this story to tell from Mark and from the good people in our lives who shared it with us, the saints, the witnesses, some of whom we knew well, some of whom we met only through story or printed page. One day we will pass this story on to those who will follow us. What do we want to leave them? What do we want them to know? What do we want them to share? The deep peace for which we are all hungering cannot be found in our standard of living, our accomplishments, our stuff, but only in the knowledge that God is, Christ is, resurrection is. The death towards which we walk while calling it life is but the boundary we cross into the life that really is life. This is the path of Jesus and it is our salvation. The gospel continues to be written with the text of our lives and simply to play a part is pure gift. Thankful 
for the miracle and gift of resurrection, let us live every moment of every day as Easter people. Amen. We may be seated. Join me in a spirit of prayer. Risen Savior, in a world of knowing and limitations, we give thanks that we are still surprised by God's consistent, limitless, amazing love and grace, a love that exceeds our understanding of life and that defeated death. Oh God, it is your love that greets us this crisp spring morning as we worship and give praise for your glorious resurrection. God, thank you. We thank you for the everyday miracles, the newness of life in this season. Thank you for all that is in bloom around and within us and for opportunities we have yet to see, but by faith believe. Thank you, God, for the laughter of the children in our lives for healthy and healing relationships, for communities of encouragement and support, for the many ways you, God, have brought us to this very moment, we thank you. Yet we also know that there is also deep, deep sorrow and pain all around us, so we pray. We pray for war-torn countries, wars fought with bombs, guns, laws and policies, the wars that are raging on our city streets, in our homes, and in our hearts. Dear God, we pray for those seeking justice in unjust systems and the fall of systems that perpetuate injustice. 
God, we pray for the unhoused and those who search for homes across borders. We pray for those who work while we sleep and those who toil while we rest. We pray for those who've lost their lives, those who died on a bridge, those who are dying all around us. Dear God, let us not take this life for granted. Be with the chronically ill and those in the midst of recovery and those who are beginning day one again today. We pray for the newly widowed, the newly divorced and estranged. We pray for the sick and their caretakers, those who mourn and those who on this very day of resurrection are journeying through the valley of the shadow of death. There are times when everything seems lost, but oh God, your love breaks through. Your love is too strong, too wide for death to hold. Thank you, God, for reminding us that we are indeed Easter people living in a Good Friday world. So let us go into the world, let our hands and our feet and our very lives witness to a resurrection that is not just in spirit, but in body. Let us be bearers of love in this world. And oh God, when our prayers seem to fail, when our prayers only go as far as the ceiling, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As resurrected people, may we rise with a spirit of joy. May the peace of God be with you. Let us be seated. Friends, every time we gather for worship here at the chapel, we take a free will offering. We are so blessed in that we do not keep, need to keep any of it for ourselves. We give away every penny, every time. You will see in your bulletin a brief description of two organizations who will receive our offering from this morning, the World Student Christian Federation, working with Christian students around the world, and the Fellowship of Reconciliation here in the United States, bringing people to, of faith together to work together for peace. Please won't you be as generous as you are able.
Jesus invites us into new life. At this table, we receive the bread of that new life. Jesus Christ is our risen Savior, and our host invites us to come and celebrate the Easter feast. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God Most High. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy God, our loving Creator, close to us as breathing and distant as the furthest star, we thank you for your constant love for all you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, for all the people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to your will, especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church in the world. Gifted by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we unite our voices with the entire family of your faithful people everywhere. Highest. Blessed, Blessed is, is the, the one, one who comes, comes in the name of the Lord. Creator God, we bless you and praise you. You spoke and the earth was formed. You drew a breath and the sea rose. All of creation sings your praises. From the dust of the earth you created our bodies. You gave us our senses and blessed us with the power of reason and love, yet we turned against you and one another.
And so you sent us Jesus, the incarnate one, to show us how to love you. Jesus announced good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight to the blind, and freedom to the oppressed. Through all his life and death, he reconciled us to you and to one another. Witnessing to that reconciliation on the night Jesus was arrested in company with his good friends, Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, remembering me. After supper, Jesus took a cup of wine and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this, remembering me. Remembering Jesus, we ask you to send the power of the Holy Spirit upon this bread and this wine, that these gifts may be for us the sacrament of your healing presence among us in a broken and bleeding world. Feed us with your power, fill us with your peace, lead us reconciled and redeemed into the world to work for the liberation and reconciliation of all peoples. In the name of God, creating, redeeming, and sanctifying, we pray. Amen. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. The gifts of God for the people of God.
My friends, may we rise on our feet and in our hearts and join us in our closing prayers. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we thank you for graciously calling us into community with Jesus and one another, and for beginning in us the age that is to come. Grant us courage and send us forth to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ. To Christ, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us continue with our prayer for Princeton. O eternal God, the source of life and light for all peoples, we pray you would endow this university with your grace and wisdom. Give inspiration and understanding to those who teach and to those who learn. Grant vision to its trustees and administrators to all who work here and to all who bear her name, give your guiding spirit of sacrificial courage and loving service. Amen. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor anything to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Happy Easter. Amen.